multiplication that we have when we're doing whatever we say the vector space is. So let's say I take one of these off of the uh, subspace practice handout that I gave you one of the uh, last time. Let's look at, this is number six, where you've got V is your set of four by four matrices. And they tell us that W is the set of all matrices in V such that that matrix is symmetric. And so we want to determine whether or not W is a subspace of V. Remember again what we talked about before uh, I left for the weekend. Remember that in order to be a subspace, it has to be a vector space itself using the exact same operation that you're using in V. Right? So we're not changing the operations. Since we're not changing the operations in V, and W is a piece of V, then we get lots of axioms that we know are already satisfied without having to check them, right? Because everything you take out of W is a vector in V. We know the addition is going to be commutative. We know the addition is going to be associative. We know that scale multiplication is going to have the right distributive properties. It'll be associative as well. The scale will work because it works for all vectors in V, right? The things we had to worry about was, do we have a zero vector? Do we have additive inverses? And is everything closed? But we also recognize that if everything is closed under addition of scalar multiplication, then we've got the zero vector and additive inverses will be back in there again. So we really want to check those two properties. Okay? So anytime that you're using, sorry, anytime that you're trying to prove something as a subspace, you only need to worry about the closure axioms. If I take two things out of W and add them together, does it land back in W again? If I take a scalar times something in W, does it land back in W again? So that's the only two things you have to worry about when you're proving a subspace. Also, in most subspace proofs that you're going to do, remember you're given the original vector space, and ordinarily that's going to be what you're used to as far as the operation goes. Okay? If I don't tell you there is some weird operation going on, assume it's the usual one. So what I mean by that is everything in here is a 4 by 4 matrix. I'm going to add them like I always add matrices, and I'll do scalar multiplication like we always do scalar multiplication. It's just it won't be weird here. All right. So in order to be able to show the closure axioms, we need to make sure that we understand what the defining characteristic is for W. And in this case, it says that D is symmetric. The matrix has to be symmetric. Can I use a matrix operation to describe symmetry? Is there a condition using some operation that we've done with matrices that tells me that a matrix is symmetric? Yeah, it transpose, right? And so how do we use a transpose instead of something symmetric? Yeah, yeah, so the transpose of the matrix equals the matrix, right? So if we start with, say, A and B being in W, then we already know that A transpose is equal to itself and B transpose is equal to itself. All right, A transpose equals A, B transpose equals B. That's what it means to be symmetric, right? Okay. So we want to show that what is true. So we've got two things to show. First, we typically show addition, right? I want to show that A plus B is back in W again. Well, you just told me what the defining characteristic is for being in W. What is it? Yeah, when I take the transpose of the matrix, it is itself, right? So what do you think we want to take the transpose of in this case and show that it's equal to itself if it's going to be closed? A plus B, good. So now we'll do A plus B transpose. 
How does transpose behave with respect to sums? That's probably what flips it, right? Yeah, we just take the transpose of each one, right? I mean, we could flip it, but it, since it's addition, but I think you're thinking of the product. So transpose will distribute nicely over a sum. I, it's one of the, I hate the notations because of this, because exponents don't distribute over sums, but the transpose does here. So with, from a notational standpoint, that sucks, but that's okay. And now what do we know about A and B? Or at least what are we assuming about A and B? So it's, yeah, they're, they're equal to their own transpose, right? So this will be A plus B when we're done. Right? So is it closed under addition? Yeah. That's exactly what we want to show. We start with, and notice that all I did here was start with two things in the subspace, wrote down what the defining characteristic was to be in that subspace, subset, sorry, I shouldn't say space, I haven't proved it yet. Wrote down what the defining characteristic was for being in that subset, and then show that when I add those two matrices together, it has the same defining characteristic, so it's back in there again. Okay. So that shows that shows that I can throw my pen across the room. <laughs> that shows that it's closed under addition. We also want to show that it's closed under scalar multiplication. So I take a scalar and a vector. <clears throat> and I want to show that this is back in W again. Well, when I multiply the two together, I want to show that it's back in W again. So what do we want to show in this case? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I want to show the constant time A is also symmetric. <clears throat> and the way we show something is symmetric is to do what? Yeah, take the transpose and see if we get the same thing again, right? Take the transpose of it and see if we get the same thing back again. With respect to the transpose, what can you do with the constant? Yeah, you just take it out. Good. Yep, I can take it and make it C times A transpose, or cat, if you will. That's what it looks like it says. Now what do we know? <laughs> yeah, we just make it C times A, because what are we assuming about A again? Yeah, it's, it's a symmetric, right? It's its own transpose. A was in W to start with. So what did we just show? Yeah, good, that is symmetric, so it's back in W. Good, that's exactly right. All right, so this first part again, this is your closure under addition. The second part is closure under scalar multiplication. Anytime that you're trying to show something as a subspace, you have to show those two things. And only those two things. Because remember again, we're assuming that the over the overset, if you will, the overarching piece over here is already a vector space. So when we want to show something as a subspace, I only need to show those two things. Right, okay. All right. So since it satisfies both of these. We can say that oops, W is a subspace of B in this case. Notice that when I wrote down this particular problem on the sub, uh, the practice, I thought that B was a set of all four by four matrices. Was that, did we use that at all? The fact that we had four by four matrices? No, the only thing we really <coughs> used was the fact that it was square, right? 
So I could have also said that this was just the set of all m sub n n, right? Set of all square matrices, and then the symmetric ones form a subspace. Okay. <coughs> cool. All right, so this is how we prove things are subspaces. There is one special subspace that we talk about. <coughs> Pardon me, a lot of times, if we just ha start with a set of vectors. So if V is a vector space, Then the set of all linear combinations of a set of vectors So remember by <clears throat> linear combination we mean taking constants times each of the vectors and adding them together that's what a linear combination is. So if I do all the set of linear combinations of a set of vectors, so V1, V2 out to Vn, this is a subspace. Of V that is called the span of the set V1 v2 out to vn. And we're going to be interested in spanning sets here in a minute. <clears throat> but all we mean by span is just I start with a set of vectors and I'm going to combine them in every way possible linearly, so the set of all linear combinations, I'm going to combine them in every way possible. When I take that complete set of things, that's a subspace of V. It might be all of V. It might be a piece of V. Okay. Right? That's all we mean by span. We're just going to take a bunch of vectors from our vector space and combine them in you know, all sorts of ways, right? So notice that V1, V2, all the way out to Vn will be in here because I could use 1 for the first constant and 0 for the rest of them. Right? I could use 0 for the first constant, 1 for the second constant, and then 0 for the rest of them. So the V1 out to Vn are in there. Notice your 0 vector would be in there. What constant would you use for every single vector to get the 0 vector in there? 0, right? You do 0 times all of them, right? So... It's not too hard to show that this is going to be closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. If I take a vector that looks like this and multiply it by a scalar, well, I would just distribute the scalar through it. It still looks like this, doesn't it? Because it just says it has to be a constant times the first one, a constant times the second one, and so on down the line, right? <clears throat> so it's certainly going to be closed under scalar multiplication. If I add two vectors that look like this, let's do that real quick. If I take a C1, V1, C2, V2, out to Cn, Vn, and add it to D1, V1, D2, V2, Dn, Vn, what do you get when you add those two things together? Yep, that's exactly right. So basically, I'm combining like terms, right? I'm using all sorts of properties of, of the vector space <laughs> operations here, but basically, I'm combining like terms, right? We're using commutativity to put the V1s together, and then the fact that we have distributivity to factor out the V1s, do the same thing for the, the twos, the threes, and so on down to the nth points. Does this now look like constant times V1 plus constant times V2 and so on down the line? Yeah. 
So this is back in the set again. So it really is closed under addition as well. This is probably the easiest way to form a subspace. Just take a set of vectors and just combine them all and see in all the different ways and see what you get. This has other applications in other areas when you're trying to um, generate things. Um, I believe if you're in theory of computing, for example, you generate languages by doing taking some letters and then talk about how you combine them together, right? You're doing those things from the relations. Same idea here. Okay. This is our relation in addition that we're using with the other location. But in, when you're doing those languages ideas, that's, you're doing the same kind of thing. So the, the concept of starting with a set of things and then doing different combinations of those things to generate everything permeates lots of different areas of mathematics. Um, if you're in differential equations, you generate all your solutions in this way, right? You find a couple of, um, if you were doing something like, see if I can come up with one off the top of my head. Maybe you had a differential equation that looked like this. Then you would say that your solutions one solution, I believe, is e to the x works. Another solution that works is e to the minus x. And then you do all combinations of those things to give you all the solutions to that equation. Okay. So again, you've got two things that generate all of the solutions to the set, to this, to the, uh, to this equation in this case. You find two and then generate all the rest of them from that two. If you have no differential equations, don't worry about this particular thing. But if you have had differential equations, my guess is you've talked about characteristic equation for uh, linear differential equation and factor it. At some point you will. You haven't done that. If you haven't done it yet, you will do it, I promise. Okay. There's a there by the way, there's a characteristic equation that it actually means the same kind of thing as when we talk about characteristic equations for eigenvalues. About that before. But anyway, um, it's not too hard to see that these two are solutions, right? If I take the second derivative of e to the x, I get e to the x back again. So again, we get zero, I plug it in. If I take the second derivative of e to the minus x, I get e to the minus x back again. I plug it in, I get zero. Since this is a, just going through a little bit of the theory of differential equations, since this is a second order, I know I have two solutions that will generate everything. This is how I know that these are all functions. We'll talk about the idea of why I know those are two distinct solutions and they generate everything here in a little bit as well. But the idea here is, this, like I was mentioning, this is the easiest way to get a subspace of a vector space, doing linear combinations of your vectors. In this particular case, <coughs> Your vectors are functions. Okay. Uh, this would be a subspace of the set of functions that are twice differentiable. Remember we talked about that C. C means continuous. C1 means uh, differentiable functions. C2 means twice differentiable, and so on down the line. Remember we talked about that last week, the notation. <laughs> Anyway, this would be a subspace of the set of all functions that are twice different. Because I can, it just means that I can take the derivative twice. That's all I mean. And not have any issues with domain. All right. Anyway, you all look very excited about that particular example, so I'll go on. All right. Anyway, are there any questions about how we're proving something is a subspace? That's the important part. Are we okay with that? Because again, that's going to be the last new thing that's on your exam at the end of the week. Okay, so your exam will cover stuff with determinants, and then the stuff with vector spaces and subspaces. Okay. But we're going to go on to a new concept now, which goes on to section four point four, which has to deal with this spanning idea. So four point four talks about spanning sets. 
and linear independence. So, should have opened this up before. Damn. All right, so our goal, and not that you would know that this is our goal right now, but our goal here in this particular section and the next is to be able to write every single vector in your vector <coughs> space in terms of a smaller set. Okay. You do this already in lots of different things. Uh, for example, if you've done anything with vectors at all, either in physics or in Calc 3, you've probably talked about being able to write the vector, say, 3, negative 4 as, say, a 3i minus 4j is another way to write this, where your i is the vector 1, 0, and your j is the vector 0, 1. Ooh, hey. Right? And we know that anything in R2 can be written this way because notice that the first coordinate here, since I'm using a zero in the second coordinate for the i, my first coordinate here is just three times the i coordinate, the, the, just three times the first coordinate for the i. Right? Because I used the zero for the other one. I know that the second coordinate, negative four, I just use negative four times the j because that first coordinate of j is zero, right? And when you combine the two, I really do get this. So this is just an illustration about how I can write every single thing in R2 in terms of the i and the j, right? Those two factors generate everything in R2, okay? So in that case, we would say, let me write this down. Since um, I'll call it xy is xi plus yj, we say that the set ij spans R2. This is a spanning set. All we mean by spanning R2 means that if I take any single vector, in this case I wrote it as x comma y, no matter what the vector is, I can, or I can write it as a linear combination of vectors for my spanning set. That's what it means to span the vector space. Okay. So write this out more formally as a definition. We're going to let V be a vector space. And let, I'll call it W be an element of V. If there exists I should say there exists C1 C2 out to Cn such that C1 V1 plus E2 V2 plus Cn Vn equals W. Oops. And again, it doesn't matter what the W is. If I can always find this, then we say that the V1, V2 out to Vn is a spanning set for V, or more succinctly, we say it spans V. <coughs> saying something spans is a lot easier than saying is a spanning set for. So again, no matter what vector we start with, I can find a linear combination of the v's that gives me that vector. That's what we mean by a spanning set.
The reason why we care about spanning sets, because they're like, why am I reintroducing this new notation? Is it easier to deal with infinitely many things or easier to deal with finitely many things? Finitely many things, right? So if I can express any single vector in terms of this finite list of vectors and then prove things about the finite list of vectors, I can prove things about the vector space a little bit more easily. I'm not trying to deal with infinitely many things all at the same time. I'm dealing with a finite number of things instead. That's why we care about spanning sets. If I can find a set of vectors in which I can use to describe everything in the next set, then I can just concentrate on that finite set of things, if I, whatever I need it for. And we'll expand along what I mean by whatever we need it for later. Okay? That's the idea of why we care about spanning sets. We also care about the idea of linear independence for a different reason. And we'll talk about what that is here in a little bit. But that's why we care about spanning sets. I want a set of things that generate everything, and then I can worry about just that smaller thing. Okay? That's what I was talking about with that differential equation I was solving before. This differential equation I was solving here, there are infinitely many solutions. But I can describe all of them using two. It's a lot easier to deal with two than infinitely many, right? At least I think it's easier. All right. So what do we do to show that if something spans or not, okay? So let's look at a, the short example here that's on uh, page 184 of your text. This is number 16. It asks you to determine whether the set S, which has the vectors 0, 2, and 1, 4, spans R2. I can tell you the answer is yes. By looking at it, we'll talk about why I can look at it and tell you yes immediately in this case. But let's, we're going to do it algorithmically that works for every single space, and then I'll go back and tell you why I knew that this thing spans everything. All right. So here's the idea. The idea is that if we take anything in R2, we want oops, scalars. Wow, I could write this morning. We want scalars C1 and C2 such that C1 times 0, 2 plus C2 times 1, 4 equals xy. That's what we want to see, right? If it's going to span, that's what we want to be able to do. No matter what I have for x and y, I can always find this c1 and this c2 to get it. You agree? That's what it means to span. If I pick my x, y, I can find my c's. That's the idea of span. Now, of course, depending on what I pick for the x, y, it'll change the c's. But that's the idea here. All right. If this equation is going to hold, what does your first component, what, what equation do you get from your first component? Equating first components, what equation do you get? You get C2 equals x, right? Written out a little bit more long-winded, I would have 0 times C1 plus 1 times C2 equals x, right? That would have to be true if we're going to have this, correct? What, would else, what else would we need? Equals y, right? What did we just form? What kind of a thing did we just form here? It's a system of linear equations, isn't it? Hmm. We're in linear algebra, and I formed a system of linear equations. That's shocking. All right? All right. We formed a system of linear equations. What do you do to typically to solve these linear equations? Yeah, they make a matrix in row reduce, right? Now, when we row reduce, 
what better we, if, it, if I want to be able to solve this no matter what here, what better we not see at the bottom? A row of zeros and for this side, right? Because if I see a row of zeros on this side, you can imagine picking a constant on this side that doesn't give you uh, a zero, right? You can pick constants that doesn't give you a zero when you row reduce, and you'll get an inconsistent system, right? So if you set this up as a matrix, I don't care about this side. All I really care about is about this one. When we row reduce, we don't want a row of zeros. Right? If I don't want a row of zeros, that means we need to see a pivot in every row. No matter how many rows we have, we want to be able to solve this system of equations. I don't care about what the constants are on the right hand side, because if I have a pivot in every row, I can always solve it. If I don't get a pivot in every row, you can imagine scenarios where I can't solve it. All right? Okay. Notice something else here. Look at your columns of your matrix. We did this the other day. Look at your columns of the matrix. What do you notice about the columns here? Yeah, the C1 is the column one, that's our first vector, right? There's our second vector. So I guess just formed this matrix by sticking these vectors in a column and making a matrix out of them. So this is how we can check span quickly. We can make a matrix by putting the vectors in as columns, row reduce, see if we get a pivot in every row. In this case, it's not too hard to see we're going to get a pivot in every row. Because all I need to do is swap row one and row two, and I can get a one up in the upper left hand corner. Right? That's and really the only way that I can going to get a, a row of zeros here is if these two vectors were multiples of each other. That was why I said I could just look at it and tell it was going to span, because these two vectors certainly are not multiples of each other. Right? So this is how we check. So this is where things are going to be very calculator active for you. You're going to make matrices, row reduce, and interpret what's going on. All right, so this is how I knew it would span. But this is going to be your first step in a lot of these problems. You're going to take your vectors. You're going to make them columns in a matrix. You're going to row reduce and then interpret. And the way you're going to interpret is going to be by where those pivots are. In this case, for span, we need a pivot in every row because we always want to be able to solve the system of equations. If you get a row of zeros, you can't always solve the system for every single vector that you put on the right-hand side. Okay, That's why we need a pivot in every row. Now, the good news is that we can apply this to lots of scenarios. So, let's ask this question. Let's say, does the set 1 plus x minus x squared, um, let's do x plus 2x squared and negative 2 uh, plus 2x minus 3x squared span P2. I don't think I've mentioned what Pn is here. Let me do that off to the side. Pn is a set of polynomials of degree less than or equal to n and including the zero polynomial. So P2 would be your set of polynomials of degree 2 or less. We also say we have to say uh, include the zero polynomial because unfortunately the zero polynomial does not have a degree. Remember the degree is the highest power of x that you see in the polynomial. 
If I just write the number zero, do I know if it's just a zero? Do I know if it's zero times x? Do I know if it's zero times x squared? I don't know. So the degree of the zero polynomial is undefined, so I have to say include the zero here. Some people get clever and say uh, make the degree equal to negative one, for whatever reason. I'm not one of those clever people, I just think that's fine. <laughs> All right, anyway, we're asked, does this span P2? Now, this sounds like I've asked a different question than what I've asked before, okay? But really, it's the same question. This is the same picture, okay? They're the same picture, all right? Let's see why. Remember again, for span, we want to consider a linear combination of these three to equal anything in P2, right? No matter what we pick in P2, I can find a linear combination that equals those things, right? So I want a C1 times the first one, a C2 times the second one, a C3 times the third one, equals any polynomial that you can come across. This is an arbitrary polynomial in P2. I want to know, can I always solve this equation? That's the idea of span. Now, what did we just do in the previous example? Once I wrote down that vector equation, what did we do next? What did we create from the vector equation? You know, a matrix, but in between we created a system of equations, right? We're going to... You're going to get used to it where you'll go right from the set to the set of the, to the matrix, but let's do that intermediate step to see where the matrix is coming from. Okay. How did we create that system of equations? What did we do in the previous example? Let me scroll back up. What did we do in the previous example to get this system of equations? Yeah, we, you know, we equated first components, equated second components, right? What do you think we're going to do here in the polynomial example? Okay, so if, if these polynomials are going to be equal, what has to be true about the constants on both sides? Yeah, and then so if, we, if these two if the polynomial on the left hand side equals the polynomial on the right hand side, what has to be true about the constants? Yeah, so when I do the constants on the left hand side, I have to add up to a, right? What about the x terms? The coefficient has to add up to b. And then for the x squared term, they have to add up to c, right? So tell me one equation that has to be true. Good. c1 minus 2c3 has to be a, right? Tell me another equation that has to be true. That's from the x terms, right? Tell me another equation that has to be true. Good. Yeah. Constants have to match. X terms have to match. X squared terms have to match. Right? That's all this says, isn't it? Now, if you were solving this system, you would make a matrix. Again, I don't really care what's over here because I have to be, in order for it to span, I have to be able to solve it no matter what, right? So I don't need to worry about this side. I need to make a matrix from this side and row reduce to see I get a pivot in every... in every row, right? There will be another scenario where we need to pivot in every column. Also in this section. Oh, yeah. for, for span, we need to pivot in every row. Okay? Because I always have to be able to solve the system. In order to be able to solve the system, I have to have no rows of zeros. Right? If I get a row of zero, that's when bad things can happen. Right? Okay. All right. So set up the matrix. 
1, 0, negative 2, 1, 1, 2, negative 1, 2, negative 3. And then row reduce this thing. And we'll do that in a second here. But again, look at my matrix and look at the original set. Do you see a relationship? What is that relationship? Hopefully it looks like the same relationship we had in the previous example. Look down your columns. What do you know about these columns, the first column? Yeah, it's the coefficient of the first polynomial, isn't it? How about the second column? Hey, look at that. It's the coefficients of the second polynomial. What about the third column? Hey, look at that. We just made a matrix by forming columns from vectors again. All right? Spoiler alert, we're going to be doing this for a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay? This is the same idea. We form a matrix by making these vectors, putting these vectors in as columns and row reducing. Okay. So this is where technology, of course, is going to be helpful. This is why I said I don't want you to be doing things by hand. I want you to be able to use your calculators. But again, one of the reasons why I said I like R for this is because it reinforces the concept. So again, one of, of course, I don't remember what I just wrote. Let me scroll this up a little bit, maybe. Move, thank you. No, no, just move up. All right, our first vector, I'll call it V1, was um, 1, 1, negative 1. And again, you can type the matrix in your calculator, which is what you'll be doing on an exam anyway. But one of the reasons why I like doing this particular thing in R right now is because it really does illustrate what happens. Oops. I got a comma. I formed my three vectors from the polynomial, right? So I had 1, 1, negative 1, negative 2, excuse me, 0, 1, 2, and negative 2, 2, negative 3. We can use that C bind command that will make a matrix with those as columns, right? It really does take the matrix and make them as columns. Like I said, you can do it in your calculator, and what's what you'll have to use on the exam as well anyway. But I want to do this illustration from a concept point because it really shows what we're doing. We're taking the vectors and making them columns, right? That's how we're forming the matrix. The next thing I need to do is row reduce this, but in order to row reduce an R, I've got to up, uh, insert the library, the practical library again. You want to get a pivot in every row? Yeah. So does this set span P2? Yeah. Okay. So going back to the problem now, when we did the reduced row echelon form, we got this. So since, I'm asking about span, so since, the reduced row echelon form has a pivot in every row. The set spans P2. We notice that this matrix also has a pivot in every column, which does tell us something different, which we'll talk about on Wednesday. The important part for span is pivot in every row. Okay? That's okay. I will mention briefly, though, why you might care about pivot in every column. <coughs> if we don't have a pivot, uh, if we have a column that doesn't have a pivot, but we can always solve the system. If you have a column that doesn't have a pivot, but you can always solve the system. How many how many solutions do you end up with if you get a column without a pivot? Infinitely many, right? Because that's where the free variables come in, right? So if you get a pivot in every column, is it possible to have infinitely many solutions? No. So why we care about or, excuse me, why we care about pivots in every column 
is the uniqueness of being able to write the linear combination. Okay. Pivot in every row gives us existence of a linear combination. If we also get a pivot in every column, we get uniqueness of that linear combination. We only get one series. Okay. So thinking back again to the very, very first example that I was talking about, when we did um, spanning sets, when I had that 3, negative 4, and we wrote it as 3i minus 4j, is there any other way to write that vector in terms of i and j, or is that the only way to write that vector in terms of i and j? It's the only way, right? So that gives us a unique representation. So using i and j in R2 gives us a way to express every single vector in R2 uniquely in terms of i and j. It's nice to have unique representations versus multiple representations because, again, like I said, the whole goal of this exercise is to change a set of infinitely many things into a set of finite things I can deal with and prove things about the finite set. If I have to worry about how it's represented, then I've got to change the representation and do it again. And that's the state, right? So what we're gunning for as we go through this is that we want sets of vectors that are both <coughs> spanning sets, and then we'll have this unique uniqueness property, which we refer to as linear independence, and we'll talk about that on Wednesday, as well as review your test. So my plan? All right, cool. Have a good one. We'll see you on Wednesday.